And what happened was that at the age of 15 something, nearly 16, um, I found myself in jail, like many other people, thousands of kids, thousands of teenagers. And um, I remember the night that they came after me, I just bought a guitar. I had put my head on the guitar and was sleeping near the chimney, near the fireplace. And uh, tomorrow, for tomorrow, I had a test. So I was kind of sleepy. I was telling myself that you have to wake up, you have to study for tomorrow. It was around nine o'clock uh, in, in the night. And then my best friend, best friend um, actually gave my name to them. And she actually came to our house and they picked me up. And um, so when I went there, she was sitting she was sitting beside me in the car and even when uh, we went to Evin prison she was sitting beside me and she told me listen i told them everything because she she went to them voluntary vol voluntarily she wanted to give them information so um she said just let you know they know everything about you but despite all that, um, I was afraid. I was afraid that uh, what they're going to do to me. I was kept in a room and there were 80 of us living in this area. 80. In the night, there was not space enough for all of us to sleep like in supine. So we were sleeping like this, like sardines. There were times that there were shifts, you know, sleeping shifts. Some would sleep, some others would sit until there were uh, space enough for them to sleep. Um, I witnessed seven of my cellmates totally losing it and became crazy. One of them was a young girl and she was constantly singing uh, these political songs that we all knew and she was she was not going to bathroom she was not taking showers imagine 70 girls are there there's this small area around her she it smelled like hell when i came back from prison they behaved like I was at school and just came back. Just ordinary. Nothing happened. Nobody asked what happened to you. Nobody talked about it. And whenever I wanted to talk, they would shut me up. And um, for many years, I blamed that them. And then a while ago, I asked my father uh, on an email, I asked him and he actually said that they told us that we shouldn't talk about prison with you. You were not allowed to talk. But nevertheless, I, 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 I think even if the government would say that uh, you're not allowed to ask your daughter if you were raped or tortured or what happened to you, uh, I mean, a human being probably would ask, you know. But then I realized that it was not only me who was traumatized. They are probably victims of PTSD too. I mean, if you put yourself in my father's position, as a father, you want to protect your kids. And then you're suddenly in the middle of the night, the door to your house is open. Some people storm into your house. They t take your kid away from you to a place you don't know. They're going to torture her. They're going to execute. How do you process this? You know? So they're as pro they are as traumatized as their kids. What was bothering me was people. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It was people. I was watching this um, clip on demonstration against mandatory hijab 
and there's a part that it shows people on the sidewalks they were throwing stones at us they were cursing us people normal people and then i was thinking myself okay at the age of 13 this happened to me at the age of 16 i go to prison for these people why <laughs> you know why that's my dream if I have one year i have i can edit my first book at some point you have to decide are you living in Iran or are you living in America or Austria? For the last five years, I was living in America, but basically I was in Iran. My mind, my heart, my soul, energy, everything, I was there. And just recently after the election, I decided, you know what? I cannot do anything. The only thing that I can do is writing this novel, just making a package of my life and give it to the next generation. That's all I can do. And I have to put my energy to build up a real good life for myself here.